Before this appeared in the Washington Post, September 26th, some of us here had to deal with, and I don't recall Loretta's exact words, but I jotted them down somewhere, like when she could smell racism on August 10th the great hearing in the Cobb County Halls of Justice. I have never felt such hatred in my life in the name of religion. It blew my mind. And I've had a few thoughts since then. Many, many thoughts. But I thought if I felt the hatred in that room over such an occasion as this, and I'm about to give my speech in part, maybe I'll ring the bell if I go over time. <laughs> but I, I thought, my word, this is just a fragment of what people are other colors, people who have been persecuted, gays, lesbians, whom I happen to believe firmly because I'm a scientist. First place, I'm a scientist. I firmly believe that no one chooses their sexuality. But I'm not here to go into that. Pretend that you are the five. What's it? One, Diane, Lynn. Over here. One, two, three, four, five. How many initials were there? Seven. Forget it. 
I stand before you confused, indignant, and frightened. I'm confused as to why, through politically divisive manipulation, this proposed ordinance has picked the fine arts as a scapegoat to be equated with standard family values. And just whose values? All of you? Or just one? I haven't even called Mr. Boss on his name, but then you're it. <laughs> At best, this has been done through hearsay, innuendo, prejudice, and refusal to face reality. I'm indignant because you have separated fine arts from the tax support of recreation parts and transportation, all of which I happen to support. Further, I'm indignant because this whole thing seems to have been started by a few people whom I doubt even saw the play lips together, teeth apart, who completely misunderstood the content, which did not condone a gay lifestyle in any form or fashion. I'm frightened because of the ramifications of what results if you pen your names to change the current ordinance. You will have infringed upon our rights to and of free speech as guaranteed us under the First Amendment, as well as that of freedom of religion. Religion? Yes! My religious faith demands that I respect the worth and dignity of all human beings. That's a bit of it. We've moved into a bigger space and have renovated the current space twice so that now we have 225 seats. We have 4,200 season ticket subscribers and a projected attendance for the 93-94 season at 65,000 people. A budget of over $800,000 for this season of which 75% is ticket sales and only 5.1% uh, was county funding. 
We've increased our su subscriber base every year and felt we were really in touch with our audience. According to an economic impact study that we had the gurus of statistics at Southern Tech do, we had generated $5.5 million into the con economy over a year's time. As of July 1st of this year, we were really on a roll. We had, uh, we're in the middle of a renovation, we had money in the bank, and we had Daisy Egan coming from New York to star in our opening production. The, and we had a commissioning of a new work by Lee, by Lee Blessing uh, and a subscriber renewal rate of over 85 cents. And then, wham! Have you ever felt like you were in the middle of a maelstrom where nothing made sense? And usually, rational people were dishing out rhetoric reminiscent of the 1930s. Welcome to Cobb County since July 21st, 1993. On that infamous day in history, Cobb County Commissioner Gordon Wysong alerted the press, bypassing, bypassing his fellow commissioners that at the July 27th commission meeting, he intended to introduce an anti-gay resolution coupled with a change in the cultural affairs policy regarding art screens. The resolution alleged five findings of fact related to, quote, traditional family structure, traditional lifestyle, and that lifestyles advocated by the gay community should not be endorsed by government policymakers because they are incompatible with the standards to which this community subscribes, and that gay lifestyles are directly contrary to state laws. The change in the cultural affairs policy would remove affirmation of free expression in the existing policy and substitute, quote, the board believes that grant funds should be expended primarily on programming which advances and supports strong community family-oriented standards. Commissioner's wife's song's impetus was the production of Terrence McNally's Lips Together Teeth Apart at Marietta Theater in the Square. The commissioners received one, count them, one letter of complaint. And even that was directed to another commissioner, not wife's song. The complaint erroneously labeled Lips Together, Teeth Apart as a gay play that contravened community family-oriented standards, whatever those are. Song himself never saw the play, never read the script. There's proof after the fact that he received guidance from the religious right. Song has vigorously denied such guidance while certain church leaders in Cobb County now boast of their influence over Wysong and how they helped shepherd the whole thing. McNally's Tony Award-winning play is about two married couples who spend the 4th of July at a cottage on Fire Island, a predominantly gay resort. The cottage was left to one of the women by her brother who had recently died of AIDS. There are only four characters in the play, all heterosexual. Staging of references and conversations with gay neighbors is left to the imagination of the audience. Each of the characters is dealing with life issues, typically confronting middle-aged people, death, illness, adultery, infertility, life's purposes, differences between friends and family, and growing old. It's a marvelous play that has you searching your soul and talking with your mate for weeks. The right-wing critics of this play thought that lips together, teeth apart, was a code phrase for a position of oral sex. <laughs> you know I've been trying to figure that out, you know? It must be kicky, whatever it is. <laughs> Since July 27, Cobb County has been the subject of intense local, national, and international scrutiny. The anti-gay resolution passed as did another resolution proposed by Commissioner Bill Cooper saying essentially the identical things related to family values but eliminating all references to the gay lifestyle. Due to promises of legal action related to violations of First Amendment rights, the change in the cultural affairs policy was not voted on. Instead, Commission Chairman Bill Byrne proposed a substitute motion to eliminate the art grants funding altogether and earmark that $110,000 to put video cameras in cop cars and buy drug dogs. The anti-gay resolution remains as a blot on our sketching, and it too must be eliminated. I think for Gemini, 
this was a, a crucible, <coughs> excuse me, crucible experience. Uh, I am a native Atlanta, as I told you, and I was around, even though I wasn't very old, <laughs> I'll let you guess about that, during the 60s, but I watched interesting things happen here in Atlanta, and when this started occurring in Cobb County, Jim and I both said we were not going to sit back and allow the same kind of things to occur. What was good about this experience now is that we made some very good friends with people that we may not have known. John Greaves, Noel Weidel, David Mariersky, um, just all kinds of folks that we got to know. Uh, and as Edna told you, it was an emotional experience. And if you saw some of the pictures, you saw the one or two rows of us supporters of freedom sitting there with our arms crossed while the masses behind us were standing up when that resolution passed. It was a scary feeling. One of the women who came to speak against the resolution was standing outside of the commission hall and because she had on a, a button or a piece of paper that said, uh, you know, support the arts and my family values don't include intolerance, somebody came up to her and said, lesbian, go back in your home. <laughs> and she happened to be a East Cobb housewife who just came to speak out and really was, didn't know anybody who was there and told the commissioners that. Some of the other interesting things that have happened have been the intense media coverage that we have gotten. I was on Crossfire. I've had a couple folks today say that they saw me on Crossfire. John and I had a little heart going 90 miles an hour when we were up there against Buchanan and Kingsley, but it was it was wonderful. I see Pat Buchanan and I've had letters all over the country telling you go. is you know that there's a big deal going on with the National Endowment for the Arts. And people have been trying to cut, you know, get rid of that forever and a day. What I maintain about my taxpayers' dollars is that nobody asked me whether or not they could use my money to bail out the SNLs or buy the stealth bomber or do any of these things, okay? Now, I want my money to go towards the arts. And I want it to go even for Maplethorpe and Serrano. The thing is, is those folks need to be able to produce things that I have a choice to either go see or not go see. You never know. Some of these fringe elements may come up with some really good stuff that we may need to hear about. If we're going to do something with stealth bombers and bail out, and I still, I still, and I'm pretty good with numbers. I haven't figured out exactly how much money we ended up spending with that SNL business. I know that my tax dollars here lately are going up, and I knew that when I voted for Bill Clinton. I knew that that was going to happen to me, and I said that even though my taxes were going to go up, that the people of America deserved that to maintain their freedoms, and I was going to have to pay for that. But I still think that we need to pay and support the arts to keep us challenged and to keep options in front of us. That's what this country is all about, is having options. And when they, the religious right, or Meg, what'd you tell me? I need to call it. <laughs> I like that. Anti-democratic extremists, you know, tell us that the gay and lesbian issue is not an issue because it's an issue of choice. Religion also is an issue of choice. And that's why we have freedom of religion, so we should have freedom of choice in all areas. It's scary times right now. Uh, the other thing I need to thank Gordon Wysong for is that I was kind of a sit back and not very active in politics. Well, I have been to every forum that there's been in Cobb County. Uh, since all this happened, and I know exactly who's running for what offices. And now that the theater, the square, doesn't get any more money from the from the Cobb County, I can grant you we are supporting particular candidates. We used to try very hard to stay out of that, not anymore. We can't afford to do that.
I'll just take a couple of minutes so we can get back on our time track here. <clears throat> Let me mention to you that uh, I have talked with a uh, senator from Cobb and representative from Cobb. They know of no active legislation right now in the hopper, but they fully predict that we're going to see some. So we have between now and January to be prepared for some kind of anti-gay legislation coming down down the pike. Uh, also, probably some attempts to uh, limit or zero out state funding for the arts. We can predict that. You may see that here in Fulton County with a new change in, uh, in commissioners here, too. Let me, um, let me read you a letter from Gordon Weissman. This was to me this last week, and this will give you, um, I, I think, a little flavor of the mentality with. I don't want to focus too much on the man. I think it's what he represents and how it's being used that, uh, that may be very informative for us. I spoke at one of the uh, commission meetings and asked for three or four things. <clears throat> Ostensibly, they're supposed to respond to each of your requests. And so here's how it goes. I have been asked to reply to your comments before the Cobb County Commission regarding the resolution of homosexual behavior and the government's role in promoting such conduct. Your comments in September 28, 1993 indicated you're confused about the summary of calls to the commission office. I had asked to see the raw data. Okay, that, that I'm confused about the uh, summary of calls to the commission office as compared to the polling results of the local newspapers. We take no responsibility for or claim any particular knowledge or interest in the results of the newspaper polls. However, we received approximately 5,883 calls through August 27 of which 906 expressed opposition to the commission action. Your second issue was of the influence of religious organizations in bringing the resolution into being. It is a matter of record under oath that I take sole responsibility for initiating this action. As to your suggestion that the religious right is infiltrating our government institutions, I am not aware that their influence is considered subversive or corrupting. In any case, if your intent was to infer that I am their agent, that is incorrect. You say that you're unaware of any threat to health from homosexual behavior. It is inconceivable that a health professional would engage in such denial. Virtually every public health agency is acutely aware of the increased risk of homosexual behavior. There is ample evidence of higher rates of such medical and mental health situations as AIDS, hepatitis B, drug addiction, alcohol abuse, pedophilia, gay bowel syndrome, venereal disease, and the list goes on. Okay, uh, and then he makes a personal kind of attack because I, I do a lot of sexual abuse work and uh, custody work and some of these cases, as you can imagine, involve a great deal of conflict and controversy. Since your claim of expert witness status in child molestation, in child molestation cases, and he refers to a particular newspaper article, you must certainly be aware of the agenda and aims of the North American Man-Boy Love Association, NAMO. It seems that your assertion is based on political and not professional criteria. You assert that the Cobb County Commission consulted with neither the Arts Commission nor the Human Relations Council, starting about then, and that is correct. The people of Cobb County did not call those organizations, they called the County Commission. Since we work for the people and not for these organizations, the issue is moved. I think this is an example of the mentality and how this one person is being used. Uh, and I'm very proud of the Georgia Psychological Association for addressing this issue. They're the first professional association, state professional association, to come out strongly against this resolution. They have an intensely active committee within the Georgia Psychological Association uh, called the Committee on Sexual Orientation Concerns, and a number of these people are, are here today. Um, I'm very proud of what they've been able to do, um, and uh, they're very willing and very able and already lined up to go talk to the county commissioners. This is one thing I think the people of Bibb County and other places want to need to do, mobilize your professionals, and mobilize people from all walks of life. So these commissioners will know that it's not just one psychologist, for instance, opposing what they're doing, but we're talking about lots of people from all areas of life who oppose what they're trying to do uh, to human rights. Thank you. I did not 
come here today with any prepared remarks. Um, what I want to, I've been thinking here what I'm going to say, and one thing I would like to say is I'm getting a feeling from this group of almost a sense of complacency that we're right, they're wrong, we're good, they're bad. And I think that that's not only wrong, but it is dangerous and deceptive. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what's been happening with our library system in Gainesville. We, uh, in June, received a fax, uh, which was also sent to the media. Uh, we received at the library a fax from three state representatives from Hall County demanding the removal of the book Heather Has Two Mommies from the library's collection. Uh, I found out about this when the local radio station called me for a comment. I was on vacation. Uh, none of the people involved had tried to contact the library about this. The library does have a policy and procedure for dealing with situations like this. And so I immediately wrote to all the legislators informing them, them of process which needed to be followed if they wanted to uh, challenge this book. None of them chose to follow up on it. And in fact, it was about two weeks before it became apparent through the media that the library was not going to take action unless a formal complaint was received. And at that time, of course, we had a deluge of formal complaints. Um, this situation has not yet reached resolution. The library board is meeting again this month and will probably take action at that time. Uh, in the meantime, a review committee is, has been dealing with this. What has become very apparent to me through this process is that, first of all, there are a lot of very sincere people with very sincere concerns that are not to be lightly cast aside in the name of intellectual freedom, in the name of anti-censorship. Uh, it is almost as if the people, with the two sides on this issue, are so diametrically opposed that they are on parallel tracks and that can never meet. We have been faced with trying to make those tracks meet, but the important thing I think to remember is that these people do not feel that they are being manipulated. Uh, they do not feel that they are part of an organized movement. I don't know whether they are being used. I, I'm not part of it, so I cannot get into that enough to know. I'm, I'm one of those L word people. I, I've been real happy to hear the word progressive used this morning. I think that's a wonderful word and, and a great substitute for the profanity that has become liberal. Uh, but the overwhelming sense that I have received from my conservative community is that there are a lot of people who feel very threatened by liberal values, and they are trying their best to defend themselves and their families from what they perceive to be a very real threat. And to dismiss this threat on the supposition that it is a result of, of manipulation, uh, a result of ignorance or stupidity or or maliciousness is to discount the very real concerns of a lot of very conservative people who live in Georgia. Um, and those of us who are not free to rant and rave and, and make inflammatory statements on one side or another are charged with dealing with everyone in the most fair and equitable way concerned. Um, in a library, our major concern is to serve everyone in our community. One of the things that I thought was a good analogy was one of, a point that one of our board members made. 
in that the library is a publicly funded institution and the public has no more right to demand that the library not serve a part of its community than it has a right to, to demand that garbage service be denied to a part of the community based on some criteria, whether that is sexual orientation or anything else. This is a very difficult concept to get across to people who are very threatened and very concerned. Uh, someone recently said to me, this, you know, is all part of that gay lesbian conspiracy. And they have all those smart people and those lawyers and they can do, they can get so much more done than we can. Her perception, very sincerely held, is that she is one of the little simple people trying to defend her way of life and that it is under orchestrated attack by those people, usually outsiders, intellectuals, lawyers, psychologists, all those people who are orchestrating a campaign. So when we talk about the orchestration of the far right, and I will be the first to say that the only orchestration I've seen in our situation has been from the Christian right, but their perception is not that that is the case. And I guess what I'm trying to say is we're not dealing with realities of right or wrong here or good or bad. We are dealing with perceptions and strong feelings and sincerely held feelings. And somehow we have to find a way to go, to reach out to both groups and try to bring them together. The answer is not confrontation. The answer is not labeling right or wrong or black or white. The answer is trying to find some way we can communicate with each other. I firmly believe that the only way to deal with any situation similar to this is in communication on a local level. Because on a local level, you are dealing with real people who live in your community, who have strongly felt beliefs, and who expect you to listen to them, or I should say, expect me to listen to them as a, a public official, albeit an appointed one. So that's all I need to say. We did get started late, if you'll recall. We will uh, make up for time. John Greaves is next. But before John gets up here, Homer Brewer, Brewer, who was to be here for Georgia Humanoid Society, unfortunately, his back is a big problem today, but Julie Edwards will speak in his place. After Julie, we'll be beneath a car, and then we'll continue the program. And I want to warn you, since we are running so far behind, Ben will ring the bell after five minutes, and we hate to do this, but we will have more chances to explore these issues that we have there in the session. <coughs> I'll try to speak uh, very briefly. I've been asked to speak uh, about the Community Relations Council, and I would like to uh, say one thing in response to what Diane was, was saying. Um, that a person who participated in the arts ordinance hearings in Cobb County, I think there's a lot of truth in what Diane was saying, but I don't think it's completely true. I think that there are people who have an agenda, who are irresponsible, and who greatly damage our society some of these people are the people who are the leaders of the right religious extremists or whatever you want to, what you want to call them. These leaders are participating in circulating in misinformation, false information, um, sensationalizing and vilifying of the gay and lesbian community as well as other communities that they attack. And it is with that false information given out by leaders who people believe are trustworthy, respectable, it's with that misinformation that they do manipulate people. And it's a mistake that we 
look at some of the people at the local level who are followers in the same way as we look at the leaders. Those people are not a lost cause and it's with education and with correcting this false information with showing them that they cannot take information without question from someone simply because they put the name Christ or Jesus in what they're saying. Um, I was a member of the Community Relations Council in Cobb. I've been asked to speak about that. The Community Relations Council is a council that was set up in Cobb County uh, specifically in response to an incident of racism. There was um, a series of two or three cross burnings that occurred in Cobb County a few years ago. And at the request of a group called the Martin Luther King Support Group, the Cobb County Community Relations Council was established by ordinance of the Cobb County Commission. None of the commissioners currently serving were a part of the county commission that established the Community Relations Council. The purpose of the Community Relations Council, as established by the ordinance, was to foster community relations. To foster relations, good relations between different parts of the community as well as between the community and the county government and its different departments. The Community Relations Council uh, is composed of 21 members. Those members are there was one representative for each of the municipalities in Cobb County. The six of the municipalities, and then 15 members who were members at large who were there to represent all the citizens of Cobb County. The council, when it comes time to add a person or replace a person to council, takes great pains to get people from diverse backgrounds. The council is made up of people from different religious backgrounds, different <coughs> ethnic backgrounds, different ages, and I was the first person on the council and the only person in the council who was there uh, specifically because I was from a different sexual orientation. The county commissioner that asked me to submit a resume originally asked me to do so because I was an openly gay person and because he thought I would make a contribution and he said to me that the council was had been patting itself on the back and taking great pride in the diversity and the, the broad-based group that they established, but they left out a group, and he thought that I would be a good addition to the council. I came to the Community Relations Council, and there were not a lot of gay and lesbian issues to deal with uh, initially in the Community Relations Council. We looked at uh, issues of the Hispanic community feeling that they were being mistreated, non-English-speaking Hispanic community to a large extent, being mistreated by the Smyrna police. We looked at issues of uh, racial discrimination in an educational institution in Cobb County. We looked at uh, issues where people felt that they were being mistreated because of, of their race or ethnic origin uh, by public utility officials. Those were the kind of things we looked at. When this happened, when I first heard word that uh, Gordon Whitetong intended to introduce the resolution, I knew that this was a action which would divide our community and which would increase hostility and intolerance for gay and lesbian people in Cobb County. And I asked that we put on the agenda of the Community Relations Council because we knew that it would hurt not only the gay and lesbian community in Cobb County, but everyone in Cobb County. Anytime we divide the people against themselves and we say that any group is worthy of hate or mistreatment or not full citizens, we endanger all citizens. The Community Relations Council took up the issue, not as quickly as I would have liked, but I had a few weeks to deal with the issue before they saw it. When they did deal with it, they asked the Cobb County Commission to rescind the resolution. They said that was an inappropriate act of government. Unfortunately, because I was a member of the council, Bill Byrne, the chair of the Cobb, uh, Community, uh, Cobb Commission, discounted the action of the Community Relations Council and said that I had manipulated the actions of the council and that the action reflected my involvement only in the council. That was not true, and I think what really is reflected is the complete change in the makeup of the county commission. We had a commission that established an organization like the Community Relations Council that was concerned and cared for the quality of life for all citizens of Cobb County and we have now a county commission for which that is not true.
face of home of rule, I will speak briefly on a, an issue that is of concern to the Himalayan society, and I believe is also of concern to each of you in that it affects our choice. It's slightly different from the topics we've been discussing, but it has to do with a bill that is in the Georgia legislature. It's House Bill 415 that was very quickly and quietly passed by the legislative body last year and moved to the Senate um, for consideration is now in a committee of the Senate and can be brought forth to be voted on in January or can be referred to other committees. House Bill 415 specifically makes assisted suicide a felony under Georgia law. The Hemlock Society believes this is not a necessary bill. Suicide, of course, is not illegal. Homicide is illegal. And the homicide laws on the books seem adequate for anything that is a homicide. This bill is vague in wording, and although it has been reworded somewhat in Senate committee, still is essentially saying that anyone, professional or otherwise, who in any way assists a person in committing suicide is guilty of a felony. Anyone who provides a person with materials or drugs to commit suicide is a felony. Well, the Hemlock Society believes that people who are victims of terminal illness and whose life has reached a condition that is unbearable to them should have the choice of ending that life if they would like and that they deserve help in doing so if they need it. This law, of course, would make a physician-patient relationship in question. And since it's based on intent, it would question a lot of treatment and helpful treatment that a physician might provide for a patient. In other words, if a physician is prescribing a heavy dose of narcotics to relieve pain. What was his intention? Did he intend to kill the patient or did he intend just to relieve the pain? The, the law uh, and the guilty question hinges on the intention. So this is just to make you aware that this bill is in the Georgia Senate and we feel that it is another attempt to limit an individual's right to choose. I have some copies of uh, an action insert that Homer put into the last quarterly newsletter to our Hemlock members, and if any of you would like to have a copy of that to see a little more about it, I'd be glad to give you one. Hi, my name is Benita Carr, and I'm a master's um, candidate in photography at Georgia State University. And um, <clears throat> about mm, September 27th, actually, I have the newspaper article here, so I thought I'd just read it kind of quickly um, as a synopsis of what occurred. Georgia State University decided to close its Hertz, Hurt Building Gallery on Monday after tenant complaints about a student photo exhibit prompted the building management to cancel the show. At 5 p.m. Monday, about the time that Benita Carr's photographs were getting a hastily arranged two-hour show at the university's campus gallery, GSU art students marched in protest outside the Hurt Building. The incident called into focus a classic difficulty between business and academic perspectives that GSU School of Art and Design Director Larry Walker. While respecting the position of Atlantic Realty, the Hurt Building's management, he asserted that the school had the same responsibility to academic freedom. Carr's exhibition, An Angry Meditation on Gender Inequities, included photographs in which he projected medieval armor onto female bodies. 
The pieces are strong and provocative, but they were not prurient. Tenants were offended by what they perceived as sadomasochistic, said Atlanta Realty President Dick Donald Barron. Barron said he received six angry phone calls the morning after Carr brought the work into the gallery to set up the exhibit. One tenant said he was going to cancel his appointments that day because he didn't want his clients to have to see it. We're in this business to make money. I thought the work was great, but I do have to listen to the desires of my tenants. Carr reacting to Monday's events said, I put a lot of work into this. All it takes is one person pressing the panic button and whoosh, it's out of there. In order to graduate, master's candidates must exhibit their thesis work. Carr proposed pa papering the gallery's glass front for the week, but the management refused. Barron offered Carr a finished space on the seventh floor and offered to paint it, but she did not like the former office suite. Carr related the management's response to the climate and intolerance and fear created by the National Endowment for the Arts obscenity controversies over exhibitions by Robert Maplethorpe and Andre Serrano and the recent Cobb County arts funding controversy. She also said that this experience points up the urgent need for GSU to have a gallery on its own turf devoted solely to students. While the faculty recognized that the work was confrontational, it supported its merits and serious intentions. Photography professor John McWilliams was disappointed that people didn't give it a chance. They saw it fleetingly through the glass before it had even been hung. Unfortunately, they didn't even look at it. We wanted to be good neighbors to GSU, Barron said. I had high hopes, but I don't think a school of art and commercial building can combine. So, uh, well, uh, just trying to put all this in perspective, it wasn't too long that all this happened. And um, they, just to, to kind of go over a couple of points that they brought up in the article, they did offer me a seventh floor office space, um, which was uh, pretty bad, you know, and uh, this was two days before my show was opening. And I said that I would take the seventh floor if they would let me put text on the gallery walls. Now, in the lobby, you know, this gallery space has it's all glass walls, so people just walking by can see the work, okay? But, um, so I, I, I wanted to like post Bill of Rights or do some kind of poignant text. And um, they said that they would not let me put text up on the walls unless they approved it first. And all they were gonna let me put was that the floor, show had been moved to the seventh floor. So I said, thank you, I'm out of here. And I think that Georgia State University, um, has its own gallery on in its own art building, which is uh, devoted to professional artist shows and student shows. And uh, students are kind of given like five days at the end of each quarter. And they, the Herc building offered GSU the space that had been occupied by a folk and decorative arts uh, dealer. Um, and uh, uh, Georgia State was happy to take it. Um, they entered into a contract. There was no money exchange. Uh, it was high profile for GSU. That's what they wanted. And it was good business for uh, the Hurt Building. But what, what really, uh, you know, what, what comes to my mind is what, what do they, what does the Hurt Building think that art is? You know, what do, and, and that was, a, I think, a very interesting um, question brought up by this experience was here they entered into an agreement with the, with an art school, you know, someone who expresses, I mean, who uh, encourage, encourages individual expression, and um, uh, they should have known what they were getting involved with. Um, they entered into it with the uh, agreement with the public institution, and uh, I, I think they failed on that part to recognize um, uh, what art can be, what art is, and um, uh, what all that meant, you know, I mean, Anyway, uh, I guess that's it, and uh, if y'all have any questions, I'm here to talk to you later. Good afternoon, my name is Dan Aldridge. I'm the minister of the Thurman Hamer Ellington Church. The young lady coming after me, uh, Teresa Nelson, is going to talk mm -hmm. specifically about uh, Jacob's Well. What I want to talk about just very briefly is based on this whole issue 
uh, around race and the whole question of homosexuality and how I see it as a basis for, for division how people work. One, I always begin every question in my own mind with what kind of society do I want, do I want to live in? And then I work backwards. And I define that I would like to live in a society that is socially just, which is also economically just, uh, that's, that's multicultural, because I would argue that the truth is all of us are multicultural. And if you're an American, multiculturalism is your culture. Multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-religious, which is sexually equitable, environmental conscious, and respects people who are mentally and physically challenged, and is democratic. That's the kind of society that I would like to live in, and I hope to spend my life working for it. I then begin to see that when obstacles are placed in people's way, in such a way we don't achieve that, then those people are oppressed. And so from my perspective, there's an interrelationship of all oppression, so that all persons who are oppressed uh, have a relationship and are interrelated. I begin there because I try to work for the educating people, and I think it helps people begin to understand some consistency. One of the issues that makes all of, all of us so terribly vulnerable in the way in which the black community and the white community can be split, and that's because the white community has frankly not been as assertive as it should on the issue of institutionalized racism. And it's very difficult to, to um, be involved in a system which enslaved 244 years, which has oppressed them in every possible manner, in every possible institution, even all the institutions that all of us are in involved in. I'm a member of the Unitarian Universalist Church, and it could not, our church could not be more institutionally racist if that were one of its goals. <laughs> and it's not one of its goals. But if it were one of its goals, it could not be any more successful than it is now. And I'm saying that unless each of us is prepared to look at our institution self-critically and deal with those issues, then frankly what we are doing are allowing the father to exist for manipulation. Um, and so when you're an African American and you see your life and your life chances dwindling in front of you, and you do not see this as a critical issue on anyone's agenda, <laughs> Then one begins to be angry, one begins to be enraged, uh, and one then begins to turn only on oneself, which is pretty clear, but also against other persons who, who try to help. So I see this issue as being a basis for, for tearing apart what I think would be a genuine progressive uh, movement. How does one deal with that? I think that one has to be conscious of what the goal is in mind in terms of the kind of society one wants to build, and be both tenacious and, and gentle. And what I mean by that is, I have noticed both, frankly, in the, in the women's movement, and I'm talking now about the white dominated women's movement and the gay and lesbian movement, a certain kind of self righteousness. A certain kind of self righteousness we know uh, 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 we have all the answers, and, uh, and, and it really is the same kind of institutional racism. Sometimes it's coming from people who are friendly about it, who smile. But it is still a clear case of, of, of white uh, domination. And it is simply the way that the whole issue around the right to choose has been completely uh, messed up and, and destroyed. Uh, where black women who had, who had a vested interest in this movement weren't even invited in to be equal participants. My aunt, who happened to head the largest black women's organization in the world, not even invited to participate, and she has been an ally and has been for choice ever since the 1940s, and has worked consistently for it, as the public has worked consistently since the 1930s, and was never invited in as an equal in this movement, and someone said, this movement is for you. And so, I would say, one, to, to do this, we have to move to recognize <coughs> that persons who are African American may have a different experience around it question of, of gay and lesbian issues and, and other communities. And one needs to listen to that community to understand what the particular and unique and distinct experience of that community is, and then begin to work with, 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 that, with that community. And I, and I don't think that uh, the community has been terribly sensitive in, in, in that regard. Uh, one has the goal is not being one upsmanship. The goal is not proving one is right. The goal really is developing allies and colleagues 
and comrades. And I'm saying very often, I think we forget that. Sometimes we win the point and lose the person. I think the goal is getting the person, even if I have to back up on the point for a moment. So that, uh, and give you an illustration of what I mean by that, one quick illustration. Recently, Sharon Pratt Kelly in Washington, D.C., called for a, uh, the National Guard uh, to come out on the issue of crime. And everyone I know, all of my friends and all of my progressive friends, condemned her, how terrible it was, how awful she was. I didn't hear a single one of us, and I'm including, once again, all of all of us, I haven't heard a single one of us offer one possible hand of help to the people in Southeast Washington, Southeast Washington, D.C., who sitting there suffering every day by crime. It's not enough to condemn other person doing. We have some responsibility for, for suggesting solutions to move this country forward. The quality of life of this country is deteriorating everywhere. The, the popular culture is abysmal in the society, and working people all over are threatened and frightened by it, and they don't have any other choice but to, but to turn on whoever appears to be wrongful. So I'm saying that we have to begin to look at this, we have to begin to work together. And I say once again, let's start out with what kind of society we want to create and how do we work collectively to make that happen. Thank you. Because if you don't have the money to pay for an abortion, what good is having the right? Um, what I'd like to talk to you briefly about today, and I could probably talk on anything the other people have addressed, because the ACLU has been there for every issue, whether it's litigation or public education or legislation. We've been there, down in the trenches, fighting it out. And I would like to introduce Larry Pellegrini, who's our Gay and Lesbian Rights Chapter. information which were, I'm going to share with you, and Larry, if I make any errors, please signal loudly if I do so. Jacob's Well is a group that was formed here in the city of Atlanta, and it is called a coalition to forge resources for candidates. Now, one of the things that's really interesting is that suddenly the religious right, particularly here in Georgia, is saying, we've got this little flaw, we're all white guys. And we're not going to be able to reach out to the entire communities unless we diversify and begin to look less white. So the religious right, both after the, um, both in the black community and in the white community, decided to meet together at Pascal's, a traditional meeting place in the black community in Atlanta, in which to form this new alliance, this new coalition, to gain power. That's what it's really about. It's about power and it's about control. What they are doing is trying to provide resources, monetary and education, for candidates in order to run in local elections throughout Georgia. This is clearly a major agenda item of the religious right across the country. Because if they gain control, even if they don't have the presidency right now, who cares if they've got your school board, your city council, and your mayor, and your governor's races. And that's exactly what they're doing. We just lost two more votes in the Georgia Senate to the religious right. We no longer have the majority. It was 28-26. That split has now uh, switched backwards. I'm real concerned. In Atlanta, we identified nine candidates coming out of Jacob's Well. There were other candidates that were running that had endorsement from those within the religious right that are not actually from Jacob's Well. Their advisor, Tom Perdue, former governor's aide to Joe Frank Harris, who is now leaning towards the Republican Party and saying he's no longer a Democrat because he cannot abide by their national agenda. He is providing them with expertise. And he's damn good at what he does, guys. He is training them not to gay bash. He 
It doesn't matter where you, what you feel about gays and lesbians. Don't run on it, guys. Run on the issues of interest to the community. And if you will notice, the religious right is suddenly interested in NAFTA. Why? The religious right in Atlanta is interested in tax issues. Why? Because that's how you get votes. Nancy Schaefer is one of the leaders of, of this coalition. When she didn't get enough media, she showed up at a conference of women's groups in which the ACLU had put together to address the issue of rape in Fulton County. They came for one reason, to promote their candidate. And when the mainstream media and the other women's groups wanted no part of their agenda, they disrupted the conference. That was their goal. As one of them walked out in Larry's and in our staff attorney, Jerry Weber's presence, the comment was made, we got our sound bite, we can leave now. That's all they wanted. They don't care about women. But they ran ads that said that they did. Pretty shocking ads, too, if everybody remembers. Did anyone really hear or read in the journal Constitution what many of the issues were that these candidates actually were promoting? No. They came out of the woodwork because of domestic partnership. That's what got them fired up. They saw it as a threat to their, their quote, way of life. But what the reality is, is that gays and lesbians are a very small minority in those that take, receive domestic partnership benefits. But they bought the lie, and so now they feel terribly threatened by it. And that is one of the reasons that they became motivated. What I would like to do is encourage you to do three things, some of which I know you're already doing. Jerry pointed it out. Go to these candidates' forums and start asking questions on the real issues. They still have to answer your questions. And watch Mitch Scandalakis. The man is homophobic, he's anti-choice. I've worked with him at the legislature, I've worked with him at Georgia Trial Lawyers. I know where he's coming from. He's going to be the one appointing people to the Grady Hospital Authority. You don't think he can do any damage in a year? Start guessing what can happen to Grady. He already wants to cut all of the arts budget. The other thing is make certain that you tell your friends and support them in smaller communities. Cobb County, sorry. Cobb County had a great outpouring of support from the community and it made all the difference in the world. <coughs> but when you live in Tifton and when you live in Perry and when you live in Gainesville and you fight these same issues, if you don't have community support, you're isolated. And I can tell you from the plaintiffs that we've had at ACLU, the Christian right and the religious right can be some of the most dangerous opponents to our plaintiffs out there. Death threats are very common. So please, be aware, and when issues come up, have them call us. Maybe there's no litigation, but we'll at least direct them where they need to go, and we will also, when there is litigation, we will take it to court. Thanks. And he 
just simply didn't believe it. I went into the drug business and I was opening up my store there. So we had a very long foray for a practice from April till December of that year. On Christmas Eve, they did a Where Are They Now series. It was a drug addict, murder, an extortionist. Um, I forgot what the third one was, and the fourth one, and myself. Um, in the course of that, the, the Augusta Chronicle, which is one of the most rapid newspapers in the country, uh, carried four headlines, four page lead headlines, uh, five editorials, uh, and two <coughs> editorial cartoons. And in one of the editorials, I was called the pun scum of American art. I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> well, it turns out I was working at the Arts Festival in Atlanta, and uh, there was a lake in Piedmont Park that was covered with pond scum, and I asked if I could have the lake and declare it my artwork. <laughs> search and seizure without due process, especially in the case of Charles Sturgis Studio in California, I decided that I should put swastikas there because I felt that we were losing our rights slowly and gradually, and I painted the swastikas the same color as the ponds come, so you really couldn't see them unless you did see them. I thought that was sort of subtle. Well, lo and behold, I hadn't fully recovered from the Bible Thumpers attacks in Augusta. The Jewish community in Atlanta was offended by my use of the swastika. I was uh, told that I had trivialized the swastika uh, and its meaning, and I had uh, denigrated the memory of the people who suffered the Holocaust. And I was called anti Semitic. They had that definition when they grossed to the, um, to the cause and offered to help me work out a good solution, and I hope you did. I don't know. But anyway. Uh, what I thought was going to be subtle turned out to be a little blatant. Uh, the next little incident came in February 1992. I had a show in Orlando, Florida, and all of my works for the most part have been concerned with the uh, AIDS epidemic. And that's just uh, used to say it, it's a dynamite thing, I guess. Uh, but uh, I rebuilt five installations there that were all about people. Nothing. And one of the installations actually contained the ashes of a man named Robert who killed himself. And he had no family, and his, the person who had his ashes gave him to me to use in this artwork. And I thought that was just a little bit rapid, but I had photographs of the dude men and all kinds of things. Well, somebody took offense, a ticket salary in the theater took offense and threatened to spray paint the whole thing black. Uh, that didn't work because the, off the gallery put the security guards there off the door. Uh, and people had to go in with uh, those who are the curator. And uh, three of the people who went in with the curator were ministers. Two of the ministers distracted the curator. The third minister surreptitiously photographed details, guess where, of my exhibition. And uh, sent seven copies of these photographs to every member of the Florida legislature. Uh, and I got, and uh, I sent to every editor of every newspaper in Florida. Uh, I yet have a copy of these photographs. I thought Michelle Richards would have sent me set, but I never got them. <laughs> 50 minutes. <laughs> Blasphemy and Christianity bashing, and I just kind of laughed at that. I said, My work is about people taking care of each other uh, and about people being, people being hateful to each other. They just don't have a leg to stand on. Well, was I wrong? Uh, that went on for more than a year and ended up with the full day's conference at the University of Florida again, where various individuals were brought from all over the country, but I wasn't invited to come. <laughs> anyway. It was all just terribly distressing for me. I'll be in just one second. Uh, I've fully, I've not fully recovered from it. Uh, I was brought up in the Methodist Church. Uh, it's hard to tell preachers they're lying. The first Methodist preacher 
preached a sermon about my work in Orlando, and he said that I had these two gay men engaged in sex while wearing crown thorns and swaddled in an American flag in my artwork. I mean, how can you deal with that kind of life in the pulpit? I just I didn't know what, what to do. I've not had a major exhibition since that time. I'm a rat. I know. Uh, I had a show, I finally agreed to a show. First of all, no museum or gallery will touch my work because they won't go through this stuff. And I don't blame them, I don't want to go through it. But I did finally agree to have a show in New Orleans, which opens on the 1st of December in connection with the Day Without Art. It is in a commercial gallery, and I have to say that the dealer is just really nervous. And I'm a rat, I really take a to repeat that. But those guys said that I, in Florida, said that I had a photograph of Jesus masturbating. <laughs> a thought that never crossed my mind in 58 years. <laughs> However, I have 650 photographs in this show in Florida, I mean in, in New Orleans, and guess what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a mess. But anyway, uh, I don't know how to deal with this. I was an isolated artist. I was alone. Uh, the ACLU came to my rescue a little bit. Uh, the people who really came to my rescue were the people for the American Movement. Thanks. In general, it was a big, it was a mean-spirited festival of homophobia, in my opinion. At the Ivy League school I attended, which we'll just call Diversity University, uh, the gay, lesbian, and bisexual groups, posters for events of all kinds were regularly removed, defaced by individuals. I'm not saying that they were taken down by any organized group on campus. They were removed and defaced. There is Gay, Lesbian, and Bisexual Awareness Week there every year, and during which a large pink triangle is set up in a public area. This triangle is regularly vandalized, tipped over, removed. Uh, the university has not provided security for it, but has allowed members of the, group, of the Gay, Lesbian, and Bisexual group to sit. <laughs> this is in February, it's cold in New England, February to sit inside a room that has a window overlooking the area where the triangle is set up. Well, you're in the room, you know, it's, people are sitting up all night to guard the triangle. Four in the morning, you see somebody come up with a can of spray paint, you can either go out there and confront them, you can go call security, see what happens, how fast they get there. You can yell out the window, stop that, don't do that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a difficult situation. The reason, and uh, that's, these, these are my only experiences, so I can't really speak to 
any other form of censorship that goes on. Um, the reason why I think that this is connected to the topic of this conference is that in my studies in sociology, which has never been one of my many majors, but which I study, um, <laughs> I've come to understand that sociological studies have found a statistical correlation, statistically significant correlation between religious particularism, religious orthodoxy, and prejudice of all kinds. The very the fact that one believes that one's own religion is the only right way to think, the only thing that can possibly get you into heaven is to believe very specific things. Having that belief allows one to feel that members of out groups that do not subscribe to your beliefs are less than you, that they do not have the same rights as you, they do not deserve the same respect that you do. You not only believe that they're going to hell, you believe that why should you treat them well now? And I'm not saying that all religious people are prejudiced. What I'm saying is that it is more likely for someone who is very religiously particularistic, and your particular religion is the only right one, to be prejudiced, to manifest prejudice, to allow prejudice to go on, prejudice of all kinds, anti-Semitism, racism, homophobia, sexism, and if you have any questions about this sociological study, you can talk to me later. <laughs> Insert in the program concerning books for sale. There's a lot of free material out here, so lunch out here, Jim. Oh, one, uh, we do have uh, maps, front lobby for those who wish to go up around here for food. Yeah, I just want to say that lunch will be served now uh, for those of you who bought lunch tickets. There are a few lunch tickets left. And I'm going to a request that when you go through the line, the first time that you only make one sandwich, then after everybody has gone through, uh, you can uh, go back to the second. Enough left. And there are maps out there if you want to go to a nearby restaurant. Uh, and I hope that we can get our program started, our workshop started, because we've got a lot of correlation building to do, and we can get back after the workshop. but who don't want to be associated with those who are racist. Am I making myself clear? <laughs> you know, I think this is a real, real problem. I don't see anyone doing constructive work around it. And I've been on the anti-racist movement since 1970s. And it is just now becoming, it's just now being discussed, but I still don't see uh, the programs, the, um, what is that stuff called when they, uh, Paulo Freire? Pedagogy. <laughs> okay. That, 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 that helps people construct a positive way of owning one's European heritage without associating it with, with, with organized racism. And I think that is, that is important. Mm -hmm. And that, but that is consistent. 
because most whites who have been legitimate equal partners in the civil rights movement have been punished by their own people for being there. There is no validation coming from the white community that gives you those awards. They come from the quote, victim community, if you understand that. Because to participate in the struggle for racial justice, by definition, in a racist society, means that you must become a race traitor to your own race. And that's a very difficult position to be in. And not only is it difficult because you're seen as a traitor by your own race, but the people for, on whose behalf you're doing it, because that's part of the missionary, part of the missionary attitude, may not appreciate it either. And that's a very difficult place to be in. But I'll, I want to stop, you know, put a pin in this question about why, are, why does one engage in anti-racist work if you're white? One of the things that I think is very important to understand is that if one is white and is engaged in anti-racist work to save someone else, you are doing it for absolutely the wrong reason. And you would do better, you would do a movement of service by getting out by learning another way. I am convinced, and, and this is again just based on history, that the true allies that I discovered in the anti-racist movement who are white are those who understand that the moral character of the white race is what they're working to save. Does that make sense? I'm no Dr. Keen. I can't put it in all the, and then they came. <laughs> you know, I can't do it like that. <laughs> Matter of fact, my best friends accuse me of being too intellectual, and, and my worst enemies call me just elitist when I try to explain my points <laughs> And, you know, people in between have a lot of other words. But understanding that one engages in the work to unlearn racism because you understand that it hurts you to be different from your parents. It hurts you to not be able to talk about racial issues within your family setting. Does that make sense? I actually think that the struggle for progressives of at the end of the century is to learn how to heal our home places. Stop coming down south to save the south. Well, I am south now. But why not stay in Indiana and figure out why after 20, 30 years, I still can't have a conversation with my family about these issues that I can talk about with every stranger on the street. That's a real key issue, because until that healing takes place, how can you recapture who you are and then get to the larger question of recapturing pride in your ethnic heritage? Okay. <laughs> I got a feeling that I'm being just a little too serious. Because I got people going, oh Lord, <laughs> this ain't just touchy-feely, let's talk about how hard, I, how terrible I've been. <laughs> <laughs> Which I can do. If you want to be brutalized, I'm good at that, too. <laughs> and it's not my preferred style, but I try to give folks what they want. You know, so if you need me to sit up here and call everybody racist, I can do that. But I'm, I really don't like that. I don't understand how you can connect. You have to listen to a mourner talk about him, which is really sad. Because I can acknowledge my guilt and ancestral, but I because it has contributed so much to civilization. It has contributed so much to civilization. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. See, to me, oh, let me maybe if I put it in a in an analogy. Jesus used parables. I'll try to use analogies. Um, one of my closest girlfriends, of course, is white. No, not no, of course, she's white. <laughs> and I used to go to her house and she'd have all this lovely African kente cloth on the walls and, and you know, she tried to dread her hair, which was a mess. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, she, she, you know, she had the, the Mexican earthenware. And, I mean, just all these various cultures in her house. 
and she couldn't understand why, although she had all of these things, she had not found herself in decorating her house. You see what I'm saying? Where most of us decorate our house based on our expression of ourselves, she was decorating her house on, based on the expression of what she thought she should be. Multicultural, you know, world traveler, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I found a piece of her in her bedroom because she had these Laura Ashley curtains up there. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually found that the most enjoyable room in her house because it was the most honest room in her house. But she was ashamed of her of liking Laura Ashley and really proud of this Kente covered living room. Let me, I'm just, I'm just trying to explain it in, in ways that you, that, that makes sense to me. I don't know if it makes sense to you because like I said, my command of this stuff is, is fractured at, at best. But what Eve could not understand was that I had more appreciation for that part of her European heritage that found itself involuntarily being expressed. Right. In spite of herself, than her, her than her kente walls. I think I would never buy poor Ashley, but I think it's cute in Eve's house. But then you know Eve would never decorate a bedroom in five different colors in one sheet. I would, <laughs> you know, and and you learn to appreciate each other's stuff without necessarily feeling it has to be yours. Or that there's some hierarchy of ranking that you establish that makes one better than the other. I think that <clears throat> as a white American, you have a European heritage, which has some things that are shameful, but it has some things that you about which you need to be tremendously proud. It is very hard to find the pride if you're preoccupied with the shame. But it's very hard to be totally, but it's very wrong to be totally proudful and not recognize the shame. Okay? And you can't be my ally if you're still in, in the middle of an identity crisis. Because then you need therapy, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm explaining this well, but, but I feel very passionately about being in this work for healthy reasons for the right reasons, and for reasons that make me know for a fact that when my back is turned, you will be there. Not with a fork or whatever. Yeah. Moving right along. Let's talk about the steps of our learning racism. Most of you have heard uh, endless stories about how racism began in America, the enslavement of the Africans, the destruction of the Native American community, of uh, the importation of Asians to be very cheap labor and then the expulsion of them through various immigration acts and all of that. Does anybody not believe those things took place? So I'm not going to beat that dead horse. Usually people who do a lot of learning racism start with that. And I'm like, wait a moment. Anybody that doesn't know that shouldn't be talk calling themselves intelligent in this moment. You know, let's talk about what we can do. Most people think that racism is some, is some immutable thing that cannot ever be overcome. And that's a sad place to be. As a matter of fact, one of the people I admire very much in this world, uh, Professor Derrick Bell, has written a book on that same topic. And I, was, I both loved it and hated it at the same time. That's my honest reaction. Because the bottom line I got from that is the message that racism will never change, but we'll get a lot of strict out struggling against it. Well, I don't know about y'all, but I like winning. Endless struggle does nothing for me. I wouldn't be in this movement if I didn't think we could win it. I'd be out there making a million dollars and laying on the beaches of Jamaica. <laughs> you know, if that was the choice, in the struggle, never winning, or laying on the beach in Jamaica, I don't think I'd be here talking to y'all. 
I think that's the wrong message. I actually don't think, I, not only is it the wrong message, I don't think it is right. I do think that people will always find reasons to oppress each other because that is the nature of humanity. But does race have to be one of those reasons? I'm not going to accept that permanently. I have difficulty accepting that permanently. And that has been here for thousands of years, don't mean it will always be here. I actually think, though, that we can point to a historical period where the whole concept of race and racism was created. And anything that can be created can certainly be uncreated. I think the practicing of the art of racism, the words that come to your mouth when you're writing it, <laughs> began in the European ghettos against the Jews long before people, what Europeans discovered Africa or Asia as the object of, the, of, 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 of this disdain. I think the, the, the exporting of it here to the States and, and, and its perfecting in the system of slavery was really a latter day creation. When I, and I didn't understand this until I started reading Jewish history. Because I actually thought it all started in 1619 with me. Many of us still think that. We don't understand how there was a particular time when there was not a major sort, a major uh, uh, amount of tension between Jews and Christians, but that there was a time when it did start, and then this continued. But moving right along, so I don't think racism is a permanent feature. I think it is an enduring one that is a long-lived one. But I don't think it is inevitable that one will be racist and human at the same time. That's a big chunk for people to swallow. But that's my personal belief. As I said, people I respect, like Derek Bell, actually think it will always be here. Yeah, it's almost like the Can I get to that at the end? So that I can go through my steps, because that's kind of like off the beaten tree. But it, it, it is directly relevant to what we're talking about. But let me go through the steps of unlearning racism, and then I'll come back to the South African experience. Because South Africa, in many ways, is um, reflective of what has gone on here in the United States, where they are, where they are in the process of getting away with their legal racism doing away with their legal racism, but they're going to have their social, economic, and political racism to deal with for many, many years to come. And that does parallel the states very well. Most people think that the best way to unlearn racism is to practice, and this is step one, is to practice what I call affirmative action. And that is a majority white organization Takes the, makes the conscious effort to reach out to and pull into its setting people of color or gays and lesbians or whoever it defines as necessary for diversity. Okay, so since I'm talking about racism, I'll, I'll limit myself in this moment to talking about uh, racial minorities. What affirmative <coughs> action is a very necessary baby step. But the problem with our society is that we see it as, as the ending step, not as the beginning step. We think that once we've done that step of colorizing our organization, well, we've done all we need to do. What else is there? Well, the else is the fact that what you've done is bring people of color into a white institution, but it fundamentally remains a white institution that has some color. <laughs> it is not a diverse institution. It is not an institution in which these people that you have bought in participate in changing anything that goes on except how your photo opportunities look. But it is a critical step, so I don't want to understate it, but I want to state what, for the record that it is the beginning step. Unfortunately, many of our progressive organizations are stuck on the treadmill of affirmative action so much so that they can't see that there's something beyond that that you should be aiming towards. 
because they think they've done it all. And I think that is a reflection of the larger society. The second step that across uh, 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 learning racism is a step of what I call cross-cultural education. Once one has made the effort to reach out and pull in your diver the diversity, it is mandatory that you take the next step and do education of yourself. What is it that for these people we fought in bring that I can learn, that they can teach me? Right? Quite often, this second step doesn't even have to have people of color to do it. Because quite often, the people of color you bring in, sometimes they'll be willing to teach you, sometimes they'll tell you, Hey, I had to learn it at double time. Get it on your own, baby. <laughs> I mean, have y'all any of y'all ever heard that before? Because <laughs> you know, it's not their obligation to educate you. Who's paying them for that? You know, I heard something that's a southern saying last night that just cracked me up. I guess I ain't truly a child of the South, even though I thought I was. I was I was being smart mouth to somebody last night, and this woman turned to me and said, Who gave your pop permission to board them? <laughs> Do y'all say that all the time? Have y'all, has anybody else heard that one before? How is it really said? Because I know I didn't even say it right. Who said your pot can boil? Lord, that just cracked me up last night when I heard it. But it came to mind when we talk about white people sitting in an organization that they're seeking to diversify and then demanding or commanding the few people of color there to be representative of their entire race and teach them. Regardless of how they feel about whether they're teachers, whether they like you enough to teach you, or even whether you deserve the truth from them. What have you done to deserve that truth? Besides colorize your poetry. So I want to stress that the concept of cross-cultural education is the task of getting out there and learning about a culture that is different from yours, but it does not require that culture to do it, the participation of those people to do it. It's good if it happens, but don't say, well, they won't show me, so I won't learn. Kind of an attitude. Because again, the commitment is to yourself, not to them. Yes, sir? How do we respond to after we've taken the step of diversifying or you know, attempting to educate ourselves, how do we then respond to some opinions that there is a general amount of cynicism out there within the people of color that view genuine attempts by people to educate themselves as pandering or, or not really committal? I mean, how do we either prove them or show that, that this is not some sort of you know, vain, shallow attempt at, at becoming politically correct, but that you are genuinely attempting to quote unquote learn on race. Well, I think how, how you ask that question has a lot of information. Are you doing it to show club to them, or are you doing it to do something for yourself? Well, that's. So, what they, so whether or not they think you're being shallow or pandering really is irrelevant to why you're doing it, right? I would say yes. So, you see how you ask the question, yeah. which would make me question why you're doing it. I hate to answer your question with another set of questions, but 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 it but it, I said something this morning. I was sniffing out stuff, <laughs> and I have to have a real keen nose on that kind of stuff. If you're engaged in that work for legitimate, honest reasons. The truth will come out, whatever somebody else thinks. Okay, and I, I, one thing I can say about black people in particular, it was just a generalization, but I do that a lot because I'm very black. Um, is that every time there's a struggle for racism, we're there. What we have not learned to trust because we haven't had any reason to, is whether white folks are going to be there with you. Sometimes they are, sometimes they ain't. <laughs> you know? And so 
All you may know about this, you don't know how many times this person's been on the front line and they were there by themselves or they were there with somebody else. You know, and, 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 and you don't even have the skills with which to elicit that kind of information. So if you understand that about the paradigm, or the structure, or you can make small work, the situation we're in, then, 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 then you will be befuddled by the variety of responses that you get. But it, the most common response will not be, ooh, I'm glad you're doing that. I can promise you that. Because first of all, people are going to wait to see, okay, now if you have a chance to do this when you're in your 20s, I want to see if you're going to still be here in your 50s before I can say you've earned the right to have honesty from me. You see what I'm saying? I, I know I sound so cynical. <laughs> But I'm, I, I try to explain what seems like you know, difficult situations, but it's really just different truths coming together. And, and it is possible to have many truths in the same space. Yes, sir. successful way to do it. Okay. <laughs> you know? and, 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 and so if someone that I care about says something that is racist or sexist or whatever, I try to grope and find a way that they will most be able to hear it. Not the way I most need to say it. Because that's my agenda. You know, that, that's my stuff. You know, I, but I'm not saying be silent. I'm saying be effective. I don't know how to do it. It's not a family. It's a work situation. So, so. What do you do if you can't say, I don't like to use those words? What can you say if you don't be effective? You can ask Jim. You know, earlier today you said something about, you know, gays and lesbians that, that made me think, you know. Let's talk a little bit more about that so I can better understand what you meant about that. You don't really have to talk because that kind of power. Well, the question is whether you want to start a fight or change somebody's behavior. <laughs> you know, so, you know, so that, that, that would continue to strain. But there are ways of confronting, you, you know, to use your word, racist behavior without shutting off the hearing of the people. Because for me, the goal is to keep the hearing open. And I will find a way to keep the hearing open. Because if the, 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 the quickest way to shut somebody's hearing off is to call them a name. So, so I know as a black person, if I think you're racist, but I walk up to you and I say, I think you're racist. 
You ain't gonna hear anything else I say, including get out the way a car is coming. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't work that way. You know, and so if it's more if it's important to me to call you a name, then I'm gonna call you a name. But if it's important to me to have you hear what I've got to say, then I'm gonna do it in another way. And so that that was the small part of what you said I disagree with. And I would hope that, yeah, we would temper to All right, he never hesitated to call folks names. Some didn't even deserve when I called them that, so you know I was all of that. During the talk that we had, one a black woman said another person about, you know, gay rights, and I literally at one time got the other way. So I thought it was more damage than it did good because she she did not leave in this path. Exactly, exactly. And you have to deal with feelings, not facts. I mean, if people only make decisions based on facts, we wouldn't have many of the problems we have in the world. So if you're ever gonna work on changing someone's mind and behavior, you have to realize that what you're working with are feelings, not reality, you know, and, 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 and make your strategy important. By the way, let me uh, explain for people who came in later after I laid out my structure, is that I've invited you all to interrupt, okay, and, and, and ask questions as we go. You know, because I'm a professional talker. I can talk over anything. And so for those of you who have come in late that didn't hear that and wondering why I keep stopping, I would like you to do so. Having been there in my 20s and still there in my 50s, I still find the hardest moments are what you're speaking to of staying in the moment with other people around if you're not going to give another chance and, and being true to what you value. I mean, besides gasping, any words? I mean, what, what is, I really need some scenarios, not name calling, but um, to, to let you know that this has. Um, I can give you for real. It just happened at this conference, and I'll let y'all. Show me how many I did. I did, I want to do right now.
you know, and if you if you're invested in it, setting up a longer time later on. Now I have to honestly say, you know, in all views, I was not that invested in her in that moment. But I took the time in that moment I had to set up those appointments for later on. <laughs> you know? <laughs> to be honest. Yes, sir. I want to give one example that I guess we can be talking about happening. Our church took a mission statement, and in our mission statement, uh, we neglected to include something with regard to uh, a gay and uh, lesbian life. And there was a chance over there, Chauncey, uh, sent me a note. Chancey. Uh, Joe sent me a note. Uh, I don't remember the note. Say, by the way, uh, I think you. Uh, we took the note, I think we looked at it, uh, thought about it for a while, discussed it with some members of the church, and, you know, and we made, uh, uh, and, we, and we came to the same decision that we did of uh, each and every day. We didn't argue about it, we didn't fight about it. Uh, I thought because of the relationship we had in terms of being in the same movement, uh, that was an effective way. Very well, I mean, you know, you said in both work settings and in, in many social settings, is that your co workers hang out with you and, and, and speak their mind to you, usually because they like you and, and, and want your respect. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't be so frankly racist with you. You know, if they thought they had to hide, you'd never hear those things across their lips. So you can use that relationship to make change. say something uh, like it's racist or homophobic or sexist or whatever, if I react to them from what I have in common with them, and, and rather than what, what I have different, I'm upset about this, this statement. If I get angry and react to what's different between us, I'm probably going to put them on the defensive like you say, they're not going to listen to me. I'll look for that common and then find a way to kind of ease the disagreement in there. Absolutely. Build on your common ground. Yes, sir. understanding what went into developing my own personal racial values. When was the first time I heard the N word? When was the first time I used the N word? Those kinds of things. I think that this work in particular is best done amongst white people only. You know, so don't, okay, don't everybody go out the door and say, Loretta's talking about racial apartheid here. <laughs> you know, white folks working with white folks, black folks working with black folks. And this is the opposite of what we're supposed to be all doing together. <laughs> but I do think that to really dig out and unearth some of those places around where we acquired our racist behavior is both very painful 
is often very private. And I don't think it's for public display or consumption. So one has to figure out what is the setting I need find a safe space so that I can work on this stuff. And I think that is the healthiest way to do it. The worst thing, I tell you, it turns my stomach to go to one of these workshops that call themselves Unlearning Racism and white folks get in there and in front of an audience self flagellate <laughs> And I walk out. Because I'm not there. I don't enjoy it. I don't want to be a part of it. And I can't figure out why they're doing it in that way. But there's so many other models available. I think there's models coming from the women's movement. When we, I used to be the director of a rape crisis center, in fact, the first rape crisis center in the country. Um, and um, when we, as rape survivors, were getting together to talk about how difficult it was to be a rape survivor, not only did we not invite rapists to the room, we didn't invite men. Because can you imagine how difficult that would have been? We'll learn the lesson from that. If you're going to talk about how difficult it is to try to unlearn racism, to try to learn a new behavior, to go into your roots and understand how you acquired these beliefs and behaviors, the last thing you want to do is invite some black folks there to witness it. <laughs> I would think. Because you know? who knows what space they're in when they come in. They might come in with the real need to get even with somebody. Internalized racism, like racism externally operates, affects both the victims and the perpetrators. One of the ways, I think, I think that, well, and, and there's a lot that's been written on this, but I think there's a lot more. There needs to be a lot of engagement in internalized self-hatred as a black person. I think we have the most, the, the most, um, I can't say, without some. No, the most vivid example I can think of that in our society right now is the spectacle of Clarence Thomas getting confirmed for the Supreme Court. I am convinced he really hates being black, you know, and everything he thinks, says, and does says that he even hates his own family. You know, and so yeah, it's just the biggest problem. In, in the black community, and I would imagine that other communities. I mean, when I heard that the word from my Native American brothers and sisters is apple, you know, red on the outside, white on the inside, and there's a banana, and there's a coconut for the brown. I mean, you know, I didn't know that there were counterparts to Oreo. I mean, I learned them though. Yes, sir. Well, I think above and beyond racism, internalized racism, there needs to be a genuine effort everybody and not just to, and to get over internalized self-hatred of everybody because I mean internalized homophobia is one of the biggest problems facing younger lesbians and gays because in 86 the federal government released a study that 33 percent of all quote unquote successful teenage suicides could be attributed to gay and lesbian youth and since and in 1993 that number was updated again and it's the new number is 11 lesbian and gay youths take their lives each day because of this internalized self-hatred. So above and beyond looking at internalized racism, I think we as a society need to look, you know, we, everybody needs to look within themselves and view everything about them that society is holding as wrong, hateful, immoral, whatnot, and so forth. To me, one of, and you said it perfectly, one of the beauties of the fact that we had a civil rights movement is that it has established models, emblems, that can be used for every um, suing a uh, piece of the civil rights movement. And so as I said earlier, I'm focusing on race because this is about unlearning racism, but I think every step I'm laying out could be applied to unlearning sexism, 
unlearning home internalized homophobia, uh, uh, unlearning bias against immigrants. I mean, so the whole the whole spectrum of ism could be lined up and and, and gone through and put through the same process. Yes, sir. And that kind of makes sense of what you started out with about uh, bias in a European American or Irish American or whatever that we we as a society don't teach our children self esteem. We have all these people who don't have self esteem for whatever they are, whatever they consider themselves to be. I think it's I just think it's just proof that God has a sense of humor. The country of immigrants is so xenophobic. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, you know, when you think about it, does this make sense? Yes, sir. That's emerged, that's been tested, and all of that. This is an evolutionary process. One of the no, because oh, okay. they all have some good, they all have some bad, pretty much like people. Um, there are models that are both directly and loosely based on the reevaluation counseling approach, of reevaluating your life's experiences. You know, to go through a whole spectrum of pain or happiness or joy, you know, discharge of your feelings about that so that you can do some healing of your past life. And we're not talking reincarnation, we're talking about what you're saying. I'm sure there's, there's a time for us. See, okay, I always knew there'd be somebody to say there was an age. Anyway, so that, that that's one set of models. There are psychotherapeutic models. I mean, there are so many models out there, uh, many of whom offer quite a bit None of whom, none of which are perfect. They all have their own flaws. Um, one criticism of the reevaluation counseling based models is that they're very good for unearthing and getting at deep emotions and old hurts and old pains, but they're not as successful at moving people into a future. Because they do focus very heavily on the past. So it takes a very skilled practitioner of that model to not have people stuck. Okay, and so that's the biggest knock against our